castles. Citadels of world heritage. All over Europe, millions flock to see these masterpieces in stone. They are drawn by the astonishing scale of construction and by a sense of a lost world of heroism and chivalry. But castles are more than magnificent monuments to a past that's dead and gone. They hold the key to understanding a crucial period in the growth of our civilization. In this series, we're on a journey to discover how castles were built and why they were constructed the way they were. How that changed over centuries and why they still have a grip on our imagination today. We'll meet the castle builders, the laborers and masons who did the hard work, <laughs> the geniuses of design who imagined these medieval megastructures, the structural engineers who turned them into reality, and the kings and barons who commissioned them and lived in them. We'll show how the big history of the Middle Ages, the wars of France and England, shaped the castle. And how, in a thousand bloody sieges and battles, the castle changed the course of that history. If you want to understand how the modern world was constructed, you need to understand the castle builders. How do you capture a castle? And how do you best defend one? It's a matter of mind as well as of might. Centuries ago, warfare was conducted on a human scale. But even without today's weapons of mass destruction, a military onslaught could be a frightening experience. This is the story of how the castles stood up to attack. How those attacks became increasingly destructive. And how the castle builders worked tirelessly to strengthen and update their designs to counteract the force of arms. Sometimes they seem to come close to building the perfect, impregnable castle, only for yet more powerful weapons to be unleashed against it. So you have your great stone throwing machines, your catapults, your trebuchets, and you try and smash your way in and bring the castle crashing down. In this war of escalating threats, the castle is surprisingly resilient. Cromwell doesn't have the firepower that he needs to break through these huge medieval defenses. But will there come a time when surrender becomes inevitable? Stone walls will splinter and crack because they can't absorb the energy of a fast-moving cannonball. We often imagine the Middle Ages as an era dominated by violence. It's a rather unbalanced picture. For long periods right across Europe, people experienced peace and stability. Even those who had to work the land saw their health improve and their living standards rise. But in the end, they were ruled by coercion.
their overlords asserted their right through might. And the castle was the crucial instrument and symbol of aristocratic authority. A castle's primarily to defend a lord or a noble or a king, his family and his household, and also to command the territory of which he's the owner. From the 10th century onwards, thousands of castles sprang up all over Western Europe. But most of these castles have long since disappeared. That's because they shared one crucial disadvantage. They were made of wood. No wonder that those who could afford to built in stone. By building defences in stone, you were able to keep your attacker away. He would be attacking you with siege engines, he'd be trying to undermine your defences, he'd be trying to set fire to your timber structures. Masonry gave you much greater security uh, and provided a much more permanent answer to the problem of defence. Masonry made the castle much more resilient. A properly constructed and defended stone keep was more than a match for the armory of individual weapons which an attacking force might deploy against it. Most of these weapons are familiar to us. In their imaginations and in their play, children still love to get to grips with them. But back in medieval times, weapons were a deadly serious matter. Sword technology leapt forward in the Middle Ages with the use of properly quenched, hardened and tempered steel. In the hands of specialised bladesmiths, the sword became a fearsome weapon. Swords were forged in a great variety of forms. There were broadswords and claymores, two-handed swords and sabres, tucks and falchions and scimitars. Then there were clubs and maces, pikes and lances. crossbows and longbows. Against an individual opponent, these weapons could be deadly. And on the open battlefield, an armed knight could wreak havoc. But against a castle wall, none of this was of much avail. So military strategists began to turn to heavier armaments to try to force their way in. If you wanted to break down castle walls, you needed the heavy artillery of the Middle Ages, which was the trebuchet, which could throw missiles up to 100 pounds in weight, and you would try to form a breach in the wall by constant bombardment by these devices with swinging arms that would sling these very heavy stones. There was a great skill in their construction and a great skill in their operation. So you have your great stone-throwing machines, your catapults, your trebuchets, and you try and smash your way in and bring the castle crashing down. That can work, um, though one struggles to think of examples where it actually brings a castle down. You know, you can weaken the walls, um, you could certainly terrify the garrison, but you need several consecutive good hits in the same place to weaken the walls. The trebuchet packed a decent punch, but it was no guarantee that the walls would come tumbling down. So when the strength of the castle's defences nullified the ferocity of the opening onslaught, the offensive forces had to settle down for the long game. If the storm came to nothing, the siege might win the prize. 
if all else fails, you have to just sit and wait. And the word siege itself means seat. You're sitting down with your army, waiting for the other side to run out of resources. But of course, if they're well provisioned, if they've got six to 12 months of resources, you might wait a very long time, through the winter perhaps, under canvas, and your troops might start to mutiny. You've got to keep your men healthy as well, and they're the ones without shelter. So it's a war of attrition. A castle siege could be long and brutal. These walls were built long before humanitarian treaties and international law offered some protection to the combatants. Starvation was a tool of siege warfare, and warlords might have scant regard for the welfare of the pawns in their game. But this wasn't an age of total war. Negotiations and rules of engagement were observed as a matter of honour. You could agree an honourable surrender in which the defenders were allowed to leave the castle or the town and they would leave unmolested, but the attacker would take possession. And that was part of, of a sort of unwritten rules of war um, that you often would agree a timetable in which this took place. So if you were a defender, you would try to agree a timetable that allowed a relieving force to come and drive away the besiegers. If the defenders failed to honour a negotiated date of surrender, they gave up their right to safe passage and they could only pray that the castle didn't fall into enemy hands. If you broke these unwritten rules of siege, the rules of engagement were abandoned. The attackers could loot and pillage what they found and, and the town or castle would be devastated. One of the most famous sieges of the Middle Ages happened at Rochester in Kent. In the period after the signing of Magna Carta in 1215, King John had broken many of the promises he'd made. It provoked a widespread rebellion in England and a battle for control of the country between king and barons. As today, Rochester Castle stood guard over one of the few bridges across a crucial waterway, the River Medway. When rebel barons seized the castle, King John knew he had to act. The king's men soon managed to regain control of the bridge. And they laid siege to the castle. The siege of 1215 was one of the bloodiest in English history. John was in no mood to be merciful. The king's archers sent volley after volley over the walls of the castle. But safe inside their stone ramparts, the defenders were hardly troubled. That may have been enough to enrage King John. He brought up no less than five siege engines to pound the defences. Rochester was going to be tested by trebuchet. The walls were shaken, but it still wasn't enough. Eventually, the king's men hit upon a different tactic. They managed to get into the bailey, the castle grounds, by undermining the castle wall. The rebels retreated to the heart of the castle, the keep, and that had been designed to withstand any onslaught. Rochester Castle had been built a century before the siege for William of Corbeil, 
a Norman Prince Bishop. As Archbishop of Canterbury, William had overseen the completion of the cathedral there. He knew how to build robust structures. William's keep at Rochester was an imposing structure. 35 meters high, it was one of the tallest in England, dominating the surrounding countryside. But its design had one crucial weakness and one hidden strength. King John may not have known either of those things, but he had a secret plan of his own. Send to us, he ordered his men, with all speed by day and night, 40 of the fattest pigs. It was not such a crazy idea. In an age before gunpowder, pig fat could set a fire blazing with almost incendiary force. Inside the keep, the defenders must have been wondering what was happening. King John's men had dug a tunnel under the southeast corner of the keep. They'd shored up the foundations with wooden pit props. Then with the fat from the pigs, they ignited a fire. The props, the tunnel, and the tower above came crashing down. The tower's weakness was now evident. Its square shape had left it susceptible to collapse if undermined. But now the inner strength of the keep showed itself. William of Corbeil had designed it with a sturdy cross wall that still splits it in half. The defenders were able to barricade themselves inside the surviving half of the keep. There they held out until eventually hunger forced them to surrender. The king's supporters, fearing reprisals against royal garrisons elsewhere, persuaded John to show mercy. There was only one execution. A bowman who'd switched sides, having been in the king's service since childhood. Later, the breach in the keep was rebuilt, this time as a stronger round tower, with an outer barbican to protect it. Centuries later, the trained eye can still spot the evidence of collapse in the reformed window arches of the retaining wall. And the chroniclers said of Rochester that our age has not known a siege so hard pressed nor so strongly resisted. Afterwards, few cared to put their trust in castles. But the truth is that the castle was trusted to do its job. With continual improvements and refinements like round towers, moats and drawbridges, the original Mott and Bailey design had been transformed into an ever more formidable fortress. Two decades before the Rochester siege, King John's brother, Richard the Lionheart, had found a way to combine numerous round towers in one unbroken defensive line. This is his magnificent Chateau Gaillard in Normandy. Standing proudly against the forces of the kings of France, Gaillard's walls would not easily be brought down. Donc Richard Cœur de Lyon va faire construire une fortification en forme de triangle pour bloquer l'arrivée française ou ennemie. Et le château est construit de telle sorte qu'il y ait plusieurs retranchements, donc plusieurs murs d'enceinte. Ce château va se défendre de façon passive en espérant un petit peu fatiguer les ennemis avant qu'ils arrivent au cœur du château.
Building a castle on this scale required a monumental effort in time and money. But the end result was a statement of dominance. Chateau Gaillard stamped Richard's authority across a wide swathe of Normandy. Back across the Channel, his brother John was still battling to keep his grip on power. Dover Castle, known as the Key to England, shows him struggling to keep up in this period of transformation in defensive construction. I think Dover Castle is a great example of the way that castle building technology changes around the turn of the 12th and 13th century, so around the year 1200. Because the castle that we see today, that in the middle, the Great Tower and the surrounding curtain walls were built by Henry II from 1180. And they are built in a particular style where the tower is square and the surrounding towers on the curtain wall are also square. But Dover is besieged a generation later in the reign of King John. And these walls on the outside of the castle are built in John's reign. And you can see that there's been a shift from the square towers built by his father to round towers, which was more the fashion after the year 1200. They were preferring round towers because they thought they were stronger, because they thought they were better at deflecting missiles or they were more difficult to undermine. This was the original entrance built by John and it proved too vulnerable. This was attacked in 1216, and the French came very close to getting in. They collapsed one of these towers, and they were sort of fought off in the breach. So when they came to rebuild the castle in the 1220s, they just blocked off that entrance there, and they built this new gatehouse here, Constable's Gate, which you can see is all round towers, and it's built on this side of the castle where the ground falls away very steeply. So you can see how vital Dover was as a fortress, and you can also see how much thought went into the military technology of these castles. Half a century later, Gilbert de Clare took defensive strategy to a whole new level. Caerphilly was the first castle in Britain designed to be defended by walls within walls. To strengthen his grip on territory taken from the native Welsh, de Clare laid out a new form of elaborate castle in which there were multiple layers of defence. Every time an attacker overcame an obstacle, he would be faced by a new one. Penetrating one gatehouse led only to another. Crossing a drawbridge meant facing a portcullis and a further set of doors. And at every turn, the attacker would be exposed to crossfire from the adjacent towers and curtain walls. Finally, around all of this, there were water defences preventing undermining and keeping siege engines at a distance. Thanks to the efforts of the castle builders, defensive technology was advancing rapidly. but the opposing strength of the onslaught was escalating too. In the Welsh borderlands and many other theatres of conflict, history tells us that, despite their durability, castles could be conquered, changing hands from one side to another, time after time. A single castle might be Welsh ruled, then English, then Welsh again, turn and turn about, a dozen times across the course of a century. And these transfers of control were rarely peaceful.
Faced with such devastating onslaughts, the search began all over Europe for the perfect castle, the one that could not be taken, the one that could stand against any storm. The perfect castle might have been an impossible dream. But if any citadel anywhere in Europe came close to being impregnable, it was surely this one. Carcassonne. Carcassonne lies in the southwest of France, within striking distance of the Pyrenees. It's a strategic location, standing guard over the borderlands between France and the ancient kingdom of Aragon in northern Spain. The fortified city is concentric in design, with two outer walls complete with turrets, crenellations and 53 towers and barbicans. A main gate, the Port Narbonnaise, forms the only entry into the city. It's guarded by two flanking towers and a double barbican. The settlement inside has been fortified since Roman times, but it's the restoration of its medieval splendor that attracts five million visitors every year. Alors cette cité, quand vous la regardez derrière moi, vous voyez que c'est quand même un élément unique en Europe de par sa conservation. Et je pense que c'est ça que les gens viennent chercher ici, parce qu'on a un ensemble complet. Alors certes, elle a été restaurée par Viollet-le-Duc au 19e siècle, mais seulement sur un tiers de l'ensemble. Et on peut retrouver ici les éléments constitutifs de cette défense du château fort. Reprenez vos yeux d'enfant et venez ici avec vos enfants. C'est ce que font les gens d'ailleurs. Ils viennent admirer un système de défense. Its defensive system is what makes Carcassonne special. It has its origins in the 13th century, when a crusading army freed Carcassonne from the Cathar heresy, which had shaken Christian Europe. The new ruler of Carcassonne was Simon de Montfort. An ultra-Orthodox Catholic, he brutally suppressed the Cathars. Thousands died as he harried them all over Languedoc. De Montfort was killed whilst besieging the heretics at Toulouse, and he was buried here in Carcassonne, in the Cathedral of Saint-Nazaire, within the city walls. After de Montfort's death, a series of French kings strengthened the defences further, turning Carcassonne into one of the greatest fortresses in Christendom. At the centre of it all is the Count's Castle, the seat of feudal power. The massive east gate is protected by a barbican and a series of formidable towers. Beyond the castle, the whole of the fortified town is enclosed by the inner and outer walls built to exploit Carcassonne's natural topography. This is a defensive system on a grand scale. It's also a system that works because of a thousand fine details. There are the irregular embossed walls with uneven surfaces, which make it practically impossible to use siege ladders against them. There are the urd, wooden shelters to protect the defending bowmen. And the bretèche, or brattices, balconies with machicolations, murder holes offering deadly line of sight to the attackers below. There's genius too in the way the ancient Roman fortifications are integrated into the medieval circuit of double walls, towers and barbicans. La première muraille en fait a été construite à la fin du 3e siècle, début 4e par les Romains. À ce moment-là, donc cette muraille n'est censée seulement protéger la cité, faire peur 
mais on est vraiment dans une défense passive, c'est-à-dire qu'on se protège, c'est tout. Et puis au XIIIe siècle, quand on va construire la deuxième muraille, on va rentrer véritablement dans une défense active, c'est-à-dire qu'on va vouloir contrer l'ennemi en amont, c'est-à-dire le déranger un maximum pour qu'il ne puisse pas prendre cette cité. Et donc, construction d'une seconde muraille, mais aussi, certains éléments vont venir l'ennuyer, tels des assommoirs, des machicoulis, des ours, etc. This active defensive system allowed the garrison to carry the fight to anyone who threatened Carcassonne. Carcassonne was bombarded by trebuchet, but the citadel was said to be untakeable. It was certainly a match for one of England's most gifted military leaders, the Black Prince. The Black Prince earned his spurs during the century-long struggle for control of France, which pitted the Plantagenet kings of England against the House of Valois. In 1355, his campaigning raids brought him as far as Carcassonne's outer walls. So far, but no further. Alors le prince noir effectivement va venir jusqu'à Carcassonne durant la guerre de Cent Ans, mais il ne s'approchera pas de la cité. On est à cette période où il y a la, deux remparts qui protègent cette ville, et donc elle fait peur à ce prince noir. Donc il va s'attaquer à la ville basse, y mettre le feu à cette bastide Saint-Louis, mais la cité il ne s'en approchera jamais. The sympathetic restoration of Carcassonne by the 19th century architect Violette Le Duc allows us to appreciate this medieval masterpiece. Many regard it as Europe's finest example of active defense. A powerful citadel could underpin the authority of its lord or establish the rule of a king over a new territory. But when a castle built by an invading king fell into the hands of a conquered people, it became a weapon turned against its own makers, a highly potent symbol of revolt. That's what happened here in Wales in 1404. Harlech Castle had been built for the English King Edward I, part of his so-called Ring of Iron, designed to crush Welsh resistance. Edward had chosen the site well. Landlocked today, back then it stood directly on the ocean. Supplies and troops could be brought here by ship as well as overland. And in building it, Edward's master mason, James of St. George, had deployed the most formidable military engineering of its day. But a century later, none of that was enough to keep Harlech from falling into Welsh hands. In 1400, Wales had risen up under its rebel leader, Owain Glendur. The Welsh saw Glendur as the promised son who would deliver them from English rule. Over the next two or three years, he slowly recaptured most of Wales and was able to call himself the Prince of Wales. And he chose Harlech as this most important seat. It was the ancient site of, of the Welsh king Bran, a mythological king. So it became the most significant site associated with Glyndwr. And here he held court. Glyndwr summoned to Harlech a powerful cabinet. Together, they drew up a vision of an independent Wales, with its own church and parliament, its own laws and universities. Envoys from Europe paid tribute. For the rest of the decade, 
This was the court of a king, King Owain. But not everything in this game of siege and storm went the way of the Welsh. Glyndwr had to reclaim a whole country, and it was a land full of English castles. Careg Kennan held out for months against Glyndwr and a force of 800 men. Cernarvon stood against him, and other castles began to fall back into English hands. The tide was turning against the Welsh. And then there was Prince Hal, Harry of Monmouth. The future King Henry V led the English fight back. In the end, Glyndwr and his chief allies were surrounded in Harlech. Once more, this English castle was under threat, but this time, it was the English themselves at the gates, and they came armed with an unfamiliar weapon. Holler Castle is besieged in 1408, and it was besieged by cannon. So here we've got um, you know, a new form of attack. There's a cannon called the King's Daughter that, that leveled many of the stone walls of Harla Castle and ultimately allowed the English attackers to take the castle. So here we see cannon used for one of the first times in an important English or Welsh siege, replacing the trebuchet as the principal form of attack. The revolt had passed its high water mark, but Glyndwr himself managed to slip away, though history records little more of him. English rule had been restored. But Harlech was soon to see yet more action. And now, it would be the English fighting the English. By the 1460s, two rival factions were engaged in a long struggle for the English crown, York against Lancaster, the Wars of the Roses. The Lancastrians had established Harlech as one of their main strongholds in the fight against the Yorkist King Edward IV. Once again, thanks to its stout defences and the supply route by sea, Harlech proved difficult to take. As other fortresses fell, the castle became the last major Lancastrian stronghold. The Tudor family made it their centre of operations. French reinforcements sailed in to lend them support. In the end, the king had to mobilize an army 10,000 strong to seize the castle. But it was the Tudors who had the last laugh. Less than 20 years later, their favorite son, Henry Tudor, born in a Welsh castle, would be sailing back from France. To end the Wars of the Roses by wresting the English crown from the House of York on the field of Bosworth. The Tudors brought stability to England. For the best part of two centuries, the British castle was left in peace, more a decorative symbol than a military tool. But in the 1640s, that all changed again. The English Civil War was a bloody struggle between Crown and Parliament. On the one side, King Charles I, on the other, Oliver Cromwell. And even at this relatively late date, the castle was to play its part in determining the outcome. With the development of artillery power, it might have seemed that the castle had had its day. Stone walls will splinter and crack and eventually fall because they can't absorb the energy of a fast-moving cannonball. Elsewhere in Europe, they, they reverted back to earth defences 
waves, which will absorb the impact of a cannonball. But in England and Wales, we held on to our castles, and the last time they played any serious part in warfare was in the English Civil War. Raglan Castle had been built in the 1460s by Sir William Herbert. An astute politician and an enthusiast for the profitable French wine trade, his wealth had remodelled his family's castle on a much grander scale. The result has been called one of the last formidable displays of medieval defensive architecture. It's the most important castle built in the middle of the 15th century. Not only that, it's the most important castle ever built by Welshmen. Started by Sir William Ap Thomas, one of the heroes of the Battle of Agincourt, and completed by his son, Sir William Herbert, later Earl of Pembroke. William Herbert's hospitality was legendary. It inspired hymns of praise from scores of Welsh bards. Raglan Castle was the most hospitable place anywhere in Wales. Many of the poems celebrate the wines that were in the cellars of Raglan Castle. One lists up to 24 different types of wine and others talk about the River Rhone and the River Rhine flowing through the cellars of the castle at Raglan. But two centuries later, what kind of a welcome would Raglan give the roundheads of the 1640s? By the time the parliamentary army pressed its siege on Raglan, the first phase of the English Civil War was effectively over. The castle was held for the king by Henry Somerset, Marquess of Worcester. But Raglan was one of the very last outposts of royal resistance, and its defiance was little more than a symbolic gesture. It's one of the last places that held for the king. And I think it's the last gasp of, of what we've been seeing in the Middle Ages, this pattern of allegiance and homage. Henry, Marquess of Worcester, I think holds out because he cannot imagine not maintaining his allegiance to King Charles. Events were completely against him and the social system in which he operated had changed. What he was demonstrating, I think, was a almost a, a memory of the system that led to castles being built in the past. But memory was scarcely enough. The parliamentary army brought up its artillery, a gun known as Roaring Meg. Raglan's resistance crumbled. As the Royalist defenders cowered in the cellars, Roaring Meg put the Great Tower beyond any use as a defensive stronghold. But the fall of Raglan wasn't quite the end of the Civil War, or of the castle as a fortress. King Charles is taken prisoner, but the peace doesn't last for long. In the summer of 1648, Royalist supporters take up arms again. Cromwell's reaction is furious. His new model army cuts a swathe across the country. They triumph at the Battle of St. Fagans, leaving hundreds of Royalists dead and taking thousands prisoner. Now Cromwell makes a beeline for Pembroke. A former supporter, John Poyer, has switched sides and is holding the castle for the king. In front of the walls we have Cromwell at the head of perhaps 6,000 men. But this is such a well fortified and defended place that Poyer is in a very strong position. He holds out here for six, seven weeks 
There are sallies of troops coming out and engaging the forces of the new model army and pulses coming back again. So there's some serious bloodshed here, but primarily this is a case of a siege. The thing is Cromwell doesn't have the firepower that he needs to break through these huge medieval defences. So there's no decisive action. Eventually, however, Cromwell does get the big guns, literally, that he requires. And he tells Poyer in no uncertain terms that if he doesn't stop this madness, there is no uh, relief coming. He is going to unleash hell in this town. He's going to unleash a holocaust. Poyer recognises now that the king's cause is lost throughout England. There are no reinforcements coming to help him. He recognises that he has to look his fate in the eye and he surrenders. This time, it was endgame for King Charles. And the end of an era for the castle. The finessing of castle defences was a process that had taken hundreds of years. From the stone keeps of the Normans to the concentric walls of the later Middle Ages. And the active defence and architectural sophistication of citadels like Carcassonne. Castle builders were always battling to keep the castle strong. As they faced siege and storm, they devised structures which confronted the enemy with layer after layer of defence and exposed them to deadly peril at every turn. And even if, in the end, the castle had to bow to the inevitable in a new age of shock and awe, the work of the castle builders had proved itself amazingly resilient, always formidable, and sometimes close to impregnable. In the next episode of The Castle Builders, we'll explore the castle as a place of dreams and decoration. We'll see how, from its very beginning, it was constructed as a home as well as a fortress. How the great castles of Europe magnified the power and glory of kings and queens and how the castle still retains a grip on our imagination today.